Caution! This video is in bad English, but it's also available in bad German. See the link in the description. Mysterious criminal cases are always fascinating, but a case that is a hundred years old, still unsolved and including six brutally murdered victims, among them two innocent children, strange spooky noises and apparitions, huge amounts of money and, last but not least, incestuous relationships? If you would present Hollywood a script with all that, they would throw it away for being too unrealistic. But believe it or not, this all has happened a hundred years ago in an isolated place in Germany bearing a name that still brings goosebumps to every German. Hinterkaifeck. Hi folks, a warm welcome to the newest edition of Amazing Facts y'all. Here is your host Mordecai folks. Before watching make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a new video. This channel is called Fun and Knowledge, but you probably noticed that most of my vids were fun related. So I'll try to cover knowledge a bit more, starting with this video about an old creepy murder case from Germany. Stay tuned to get all the details, find out about recent new discoveries and a new suspect that no one had on the list for a century. But now have fun! When you enter the name Hinterkaifeck in Google Earth, you will just find a lone tree at a crossing of two small pasture roads. A small memorial had been erected here, but the farm where it all happened was located some hundred yards to the northeast. No trace remains of the farm today. The name Hinterkaifeck was never found in official documents or charts, as this has just been a nickname for the farm located a quarter mile southwest of the village Gröbon, with a population of 60 in 1922. From this village, the farm had its official mail address, Gröbon 27.5. The village belonged to the township of Wangen, the county of Schrobenhausen in Upper Bavaria. On March 31, 1922, six people have been murdered there. The widow, Victoria Gabriel, owner of the farm, her parents, Andreas and Cecilia Gruber, Victoria's children, seven-year-old Cecilia Gabriel and two-year-old Josef Gabriel, and their mate, Maria Baumgartner. The Victims the farm originally belonged to the farmer Andreas Gruber, 64 years old, and his wife Cecilia, 72 years old. Remarkable is that Andreas started to work in Hinterkaifeck as a farmhand, but when the owner of the farm, Cecilia's first husband Josef Assam, died, he married the wife of his former employer, which made him, according to the old laws, the owner of the farm. Cecilia had four children from her first husband, but only two of them survived childhood. They had already left the farm in 1922. From Andreas, she had three daughters, but only the eldest survived childhood. Victoria Gabriel, née Gruber, 35 years old. She is the most interesting victim. Unfortunately, we have no good photo of her. This may be Andreas Gruber and his daughter Victoria, but this is not confirmed. Therefore, we will use this symbolic pick as a placeholder. She spent her childhood on the farm, was said to have been extraordinarily beautiful and had a nice singing voice, making her the lead singer in the church choir. In 1903, when she was 16, she admitted to neighbors that she was in an incest relation with her father. One of the housemates even quit her job after founding father and daughter in the attic mid-intercourse. In 1914, she married Carl Gabriel and her parents officially gave the farm to the newlyweds. But Carl was immediately drafted for World War I and was killed in action shortly afterwards. In January 1915, Victoria gave birth to her daughter Cecilia. We will use her nickname Silly to not confuse her with her grandmother of the same name. The time period between Carl's drafting on August 14th of 1914 and Silly's birth was nearly five months, but rumors had it that he had left the farm already in April or May 1914, complaining about his father-in-law, quote, hoarding his money, you won't even get a decent lunch, unquote. 
Some people even reported that he had also stated that his father-in-law still having an incestuous relationship with Victoria. No, God, please, no! He seemed to have left the farm indeed, as his home address in his military files was the address of his parents, not of his wife. So, if Zilli was really Karl Gabriel's daughter or Andreas Gruber's, it's not known. However, some reported Andreas Gruber and his daughter to the police. Who it was is unknown as the documents from this time had been lost. Father and daughter were trialed in 1915 and found guilty of blood shame, as incest was called in at this time. Both were imprisoned in February 1916, Victoria for one month and her father for one year. In August 1918, the widowed Victoria started a relationship with the owner of the neighboring farm, Lorenz Schlittenbauer, then 44 years old, 13 years older than her, only one month after his first wife had died. She became pregnant and Lorenz offered her father Andreas to marry Victoria, but he refused to give his blessings. On September 7, 1919, Victoria's second child, Joseph, was born. Again, we do not know exactly who is the father. Three days later, Lorenz denied being the father and accused Andreas Gruber of incest. Due to Gruber's crime register, he was arrested and put to prison. In the following days, Victoria begged Lorenz to accept Joseph as his child and revoke the accusations against her father. Lorenz later said that she offered him money and even tempted him sexually. On September 23rd, he gave in, accepted Joseph as his son, and Andreas Gruber was released from prison four days later. As Lorenz was still not allowed to marry Victoria, he marries the 18 years younger Anna Dick only three weeks after he first met her. Lorenz was a rather successful farmer, relatively wealthy, and despite the episode with Victoria Gabriel, the inhabitants of Gröbern made him their Ortsführer, a kind of low-ranking mayor. Ooh, that was a very long introduction, but as you will see, all of this may be important when it comes to determining the culprit. The murders took place on March 31st, 1922, but in the days before, a lot of strange things started to happen at and around Hinterkaifeck. Some days before the murders, the priest of the village found an envelope in the church with 700 gold marks, equivalent to around about 4,000 US dollars nowadays. From the handwriting of the letter, he thought that the money came from Victoria Gabriel. At the same time, seven-year-old Silly showed up in school very tired. She told the teacher that there had been strange noises heard on the farm and either her mother or her grandmother ran away in desperation and found crying in the woods hours later after the family had searched for her. March 13, 1922 one day before the murders. Andreas Gruber met Lorenz Schlittenbauer in the forest and told him about the strange noises, like footsteps. He said that he searched the attic but found nothing. But more strange things occurred. Gruber claimed that the door to the motor house had been cracked open, but from the small chamber you have no access to the house. The door to the barn also looked like someone had tried to break it open, but unsuccessfully. Near the house, he had found footprints in the snow leading directly to the house, but even though he searched the entire premises, he couldn't find tracks leading away. But he found a newspaper from Munich from the same day, but when he asked the mailman, he claimed that no one in his area has subscribed to such a newspaper. And finally, that the only key to the house's front door had vanished. Lorenz suggested to call the police, but Andreas refused. At half past four on March 31st, Friday, the new maid of the family, 45-year-old Maria Baumgartner, arrived in Hinterkaifeck. She was supposed to start her new job the next morning. As she had a crippled leg and also was mentally handicapped, she was accompanied by her sister, who was the last person who saw the family alive. She left the farm at half past five. No one, except for the murderer or murderers, knows what happened that night. The next day, April 1st, Silly was absent in school. On the next day, a Sunday, the villagers noted the absence of the entire family during service in church. 
Some people visited the farm in that time, but left when no one opened the door. The mailman left the mail on the window sill of the kitchen and noticed that the crib with the baby was not standing at the kitchen window as usual. On Tuesday, April 4th, 9 a.m., the mechanic Albert Hofner had an appointment with Andreas Gruber to repair the engine on the farm. When he found no one, he waited for one hour. He heard the cattle in the stables and the dog barking inside. All doors were locked. As he did not want to leave without the job done, he picked the lock of the motorhouse and started to work on the engine. At 2.30 p.m. he was finished, locked the door and walked around the house. Now he found the door to the barn open and the dog was leashed outside the house, but still no one reacted to his calls. He looked in the barn but did not enter. He cycled back to Gröbern and told the daughters of Lorenz Schlittenbauer that the job had been done, but there was no one on the farm. Lorenz sent his son and his stepson to the farm. They returned at half past three, reporting they found no one. Immediately, Lorenz led a search party of five, including himself, to the farm, where they again found all doors locked and heard the dog barking inside. They entered the machinery shed through the open gate and broke through the door to the barn. In the barn, in front of the door to the stable, they found four bodies, covered with hay and pieces of wood and a door. Lorenz pulled the bodies out of the hay to check for vital signs, but they had all been dead for days. Lorenz entered the stable and went into the living area, while the rest of the search party waited outside. They all could clearly hear when Lorenz opened the front door from the inside, with the very key that Andreas Gruber had reported missing a week ago. Lorenz would later tell the police that he found the key in the lock. They found the body of the youngest son Josef in his crib and the body of the maid Maria in her room. Lorenz remained on the farm while the others went to Gröbern to inform the authorities. A runner had to be sent to Weidhofen where the next telephone was. At 6 p.m. the mayor of Wangen and the police arrived. 15 minutes later the police in Munich received the phone call. At around 7 p.m. the police of Schrobenhausen arrived at the farm and found it full of spectators looking around everywhere. Some women from the village even had used the kitchen to prepare snacks. From reading the police report, this seemed to have been usual behavior in this time period. But now, the crime scene is finally roped off. The police from Munich arrived at 1.30 am, but waited till morning to visit the crime scene, as there was no electric light on the farm. April 5th, 1922. The police could finally start searching for clues. The autopsy of the six bodies was performed in front of the house on the kitchen table. Andreas Gruber was barefoot, wearing pants and a shirt he used to sleep in. He was, like all the other victims, bludgeoned to death with brute force, hit on the head and in the face several times with a blunt object, like a pickaxe. He had been hit so brutally that parts of his skull were exposed. Seven-year-old Silly Gabriel also was barefoot, just wearing a short nightshirt with blue polka dots and no underwear. She also had severe skull damage and a long slit wound on either the chin or the throat, both are mentioned in the report. In her hands she held big tufts of her own hair. Police concluded that she had initially survived the attacks and ripped out her own hair in agony before finally passing away after several hours. Cecilia Gruber and Victoria Gabriel. Both women were fully clothed, but Victoria wore no shoes. Cecilia's right face side has been smashed. Both women had severe skull damage from multiple strikes on the head with extreme force. Both women had also star-shaped crack marks on their skulls. One of the two has throttle marks on the throat, but the report does not state which one. Maria Baumgartner was found in her chamber, lying on her left side on the floor, still wearing her heavy street boots, killed by multiple strikes on the head, lying in a large puddle of blood. The two-year-old Josef was found in his buggy. The buggy stood in the chamber where Victoria Gabriel used to sleep with her kids. The buggy had a tarp roof and the murderer had killed Josef by hammering a blunt weapon through that roof, hitting the skull of the toddler so hard that brain tissue was found on the walls. Here too was a lot of blood on the floor, but police did not find a single footprint in all the blood. 
The dog was found in the stable, alive, but with an injured eye and very agitated and aggressive. Other findings in the house. Even though the crime scene had been contaminated by the curious village folk, the police concluded that the murderer or murderers must have stayed on the farm for several days. The cattle and the dog had been well fed, the cattle was milked, the milk carefully filled in tin barrels. All the bread had been used up and some of the meat hanging in the foot chamber had been cut. The Gruber Gabriel family was known to be very wealthy, so at first police thought of a robbery. But even though there was plenty of valuables and a large amount of money in the house, nothing seemed to have been stolen. Over 21,000 marks in stocks and bonds and over 2,000 marks in cash, equivalent to over 125,000 US dollars in today's money, could have been found easily, especially considering the culprits had all the time in the world. There had been rumors in the village that Andreas Gruber planned to build a new stable and had therefore 100,000 marks, over half a million dollars in today's money, stored in cash. The money was not found, but it could not be proven if these rumors were true. However, it could be confirmed that the family had borrowed 8,000 marks, around $45,000, from relatives for new machinery. These kind of loans were common practice in these times. Lorenz told the police of the strange noises Gruber had heard. Police searched the attic and found two large indentions in the hay, as if two persons had slept there. They also noticed that some of the roof tiles had been moved away, so that the entire premises could be overlooked. Conclusion Reconstruction From all the traces and facts and the testimonies of all the witnesses, the police reconstructed the following. One or two persons who were accustomed with the farm stole the front keys after unsuccessfully trying to break in and hid on the attic. Between 8 and 11 p.m. on March 31st, they somehow managed to lure one family member after the other into the barn. The ale through the stables connecting the kitchen's foreroom and the barn was so narrow that only one person could walk there at a time. How they were lured there remains a mystery. Tests at the locations showed that screams from the barn could not be heard in the kitchen. Another theory was that the culprits had loosened one of the cows in the stable and that the commotion there was heard in the kitchen. Victoria supposedly was killed first. When she didn't come back, Cecilia Gruber came into the barn to look for her daughter. When she also didn't come back, Andreas Gruber and Silly followed, in which order remained unknown, probably Silly first, then Andreas. After that, the murderer sneaked into the house and surprised the maid Maria Baumgartner who was in the middle of unpacking her luggage. She was struck down from behind. Then they went into Victoria's bedroom where the stroller with the sleeping toddler stood. Little Josef was hit several times through the roof of the stroller. Later the bodies were covered, the four dead in the barn with hay and an old door, the maid with bed cover, Joseph with the red skirt of Victoria. Some clothes were hung on the windowsill, maybe to prevent the body to be seen when looking from the outside through the window. The police identified a pickaxe belonging on the farm as the murder weapon for all six victims. The pickaxe had been found in the stables where someone had put it in the food bucket of the cows. The cows had licked on the axe, but there had still been brown residue on it, maybe dried blood. After that, the room of Victoria had been searched. On her bed, the police found some papers and an empty small wallet. If the wallet had contained money, they could not determine. It is unlikely that the small wallet contained a lot of cash, especially not the 100,000 marks that Andreas Gruber was rumored to have. The rest of the house was obviously never thoroughly searched. Even with a quick search, the culprits would have found all the money easily. Instead, they had spent at least two days on the farm, caring for all animals, preparing meals, eating and sleeping. But why? The extreme force used to kill the victims, literally an overkill, normally means that a lot of emotion had been involved and that the murderer had connection to the victim, even to two-year-old Josef. The covering of the bodies is either done to prevent the victims to be found, which is unlikely here, or from remorse. Same remorse may have been the cause for caring about the farm after the killing. When the farm was demolished in 1923, the real murder weapon was found under the floorboards of the attic. A so-called Reuthaue, 
a tool for uprooting small trees or shrubs. This tool still had dried blood and human hair sticking to it. It could be identified by Georg Siegel, a former helper on the farm. He remembered that Andreas Gruber had manufactured that tool himself. The handle once had been repaired with a long screw. The head fit exactly in the star-shaped marks on the skulls of the victims. Additionally, a jackknife was found. We will hear more of that knife later. The suspects. The fact that the Gruber Gabriel family was notorious in the villages around Hinterkaifeck and relatively wealthy and known for having huge amounts of cash stored on the farm lead to a high number of suspects. Altogether, police named 51 men as possible murders of the family. Here I will only focus on the most interesting. 15 of the 51 could produce an alibi. Of the remaining 36, 14 men simply made the list for being vagabonds or petty criminals who had been seen in the area at that time. Some of them were registered for crimes like avoiding work. And another 11 got accused by villagers for other reasons, personal revenge for example. So 11 men remain as suspects. Number 1. Josef Borg, Ludwig and Paul Blunder. As mentioned, a lot of people were suspected because they had committed crimes before and had been seen around. The Blunder brothers, Ludwig and Paul, were two notorious robbers. In 1926, a woman and former lover of Paul Blunder accused them of being the Hinterkaifeck murderers. Two boys who matched their descriptions had been seen two days before the crime in the proximity of the farm. On April 1st at 3 a.m., only four to seven hours after the murders, again two boys have been seen here. On the evening of the same day, they had committed a robbery in Hagau, but had to flee without any money. Three days later, on April 4th, they had been more successful when they robbed a family in Karlshult, taking 2,000 marks, more than $10,000. Even though the police was sure the brother said committed the two robberies in April, they never got enough evidence for a lawsuit. Josef Borg was an accomplice of the two brothers. Supposedly, he assisted with the robbery in Karlsruhe. Borg had also given the brothers a false alibi for the time of the Hinterkaifeck murders because the brothers had asked him to do so. On the other hand, even though they were robbers, they normally only used violence when it was needed. An overkill like in Hinterkaifeck, including the brutal murder of two little children, seemed out of their league. So I think we can cross them from our list. Number 2. Albert Hofner. He had been the mechanic who repaired the engine on the farm and his report led to the discovery of the crime. In the eye of some policemen, this made him suspicious. However, he had no motive whatsoever to brutally erase an entire family and everything he reported seemed to be matching with the evidence at the crime scene. Therefore, he had never been officially accused. Number 3. Carl Gabriel Jr. Had been the husband of Victoria Gabriel and had been killed in action in World War I on December 12, 1914 in France. Or had he? In 1951, a Matthäus Eser from Weidhofen claimed that he was questioned by a Russian soldier in a POW camp in 1945. The soldier spoke German and had the typical accent of the Weidhofen area. After that Russian soldier found out that Matthäus was from Weidhofen and knew Hinterkaifeck, he immediately released him and provided him with papers so he could return home. During their farewell, that soldier said, quote, Tell them the Hinterkaifeck murderer has released you, unquote. As Matthäus Eser was not the only person who claimed to have seen Gabriel after 1918, the police pursued this trace. However, two comrades of Karl testified that they had seen his body and he had definitely been shot. The German War Graves Commission had found remainders of the skeleton with Karl Gabriel's ID tag. Therefore, today he is officially buried on the Soldiers' Cemetery in saint laurent blagny France, with his name engraved on a memorial. So, we must assume that either Matthäus Eser and the other witnesses had lied, or another person had fooled them. 4. The rest of the Gabriel family. Mainly the three brothers of Karl Gabriel Jr., Anton, Josef and Jakob. 
After three of the six Gabriel sons died in World War I, the remaining three worked on the farm. There had been a long feud between the Gruber and the Gabriel family. After marrying Victoria, Karl Gabriel Jr. had officially been the owner of Hinterkaifeck, but was treated so badly by his parents-in-law that he quickly returned back to his family farm, some 20 minutes away from Hinterkaifeck. His parents and brothers were outraged by how bad Karl had been treated, so they had a strong motive. The 16-year-old maid of the Gabriel farm, Maria Missel, noticed some unusual behavior of all the Gabriel family members. On April 4th, the day the bodies were discovered, Maria was told to not clean the rooms of the brothers, a chore she normally did every morning. At 6 p.m., Josef left the farm to check the forest that belonged to the farm, a task that usually took him 10 minutes maximum. However, this day he came back after two hours. During the supper, the maid was repeatedly sent out as if she should not hear what the family was talking about. When she was out to get firewood, even though there was already enough in the house, the wife of Karl Senior, Franziska Gabriel, suddenly came out and yelled, Marie, the Hinterkaifeck people have been clubbed to death. Quick, come in and lock the doors. I'm afraid. Later, Marie asked how they knew about all that, and she answered that Anton has told her. Marie wondered how he could knew about that, as Anton had not left the farm the entire day. During the next days, the Gabriels repeatedly visited Hinterkaifeck to tend for the animals, milk the cows, but they also took things away and the family begged Marie not to tell anyone. They also dug in the basement as Carl Sr. knew that money was buried under a loose stone. They found the stone, but the earth had already been disturbed, so they assumed the murderers had found the money. Later, Marie remembered that Jakob complained about losing his jackknife in Hinterkaifeck. When the farm was demolished, a jackknife was found under the floorboards, together with a murder weapon. The remaining Gruber family inherited the farm, even though the Gabriels filed a lawsuit as they wanted to get the farm as well. In the end, they settled with a compromise. The Gabriels got the farm after paying a relatively small price. All that was enough for the police to arrest all three remaining Gabriel brothers, but the evidence was not enough for a trial, so they had to be released. Number 5. The Gump Brothers Adolf and Anton would today be called terrorists. They belonged to an underground organization and had committed or taken part in political murders. Police had searched for them for numerous crimes, but not for the Hinterkaifeck murders. In 1941, a woman named Christens Meyer, née Gamp, confessed to a priest right before her death that her brothers committed the Hinterkaifeck murders. Even though she asked him to inform the police after her death, the priest remained silent, keeping the seal of confession. Until he told someone in 1952 and the police started investigating. Adolf Gamp had died in 1944, but Anton was still at large. He was arrested, but insisted he did not know anything about Hinterkaifeck. However, his cellmate had heard him say, and all that because of the child. Investigators had heard rumors about Anton Gamp being the father of Victoria Gabriel's youngest child, Josef. On the day Josef was born, the grandfather, Andreas Gruber, had said about Josef's father, I had preferred any other guy, but it had to be that basket weaver. Anton Gamp's profession indeed was basket weaver. But the state attorney had to end the investigations in 1954 due to lack of evidence. But would Gamp's sisters really lie on her deathbed? Number 6. Lorenz Schlittenbauer The neighbor and supposed father of little Josef Gruber had of course been suspect number one for the police. He had been denied the marriage with Victoria by Andreas Gruber and Victoria had played with his feelings for her. The police also noted that he behaved strangely at the crime scene. He had been extremely bumptious and imposed his help on the police officers. When he rounded up his neighbors after his son reported that the farm was deserted, he had done that with the words, quote, In Hinterkaifeck everyone was clubbed to death, unquote. something he could not have known at that time. On the farm he had opened the front door with the key. 
the very key that Andreas Gruber had reported missing days ago. Lorenz claimed the key had stuck in the door from the inside. He may have had a motive for killing Andreas Gruber and maybe even Victoria Gabriel, but would he really have brutally killed a toddler that might have been his son? And the innocent seven-year-old girl? He wouldn't have cared for the money, he was rather wealthy himself. All police officers that talked to him reported that a brutal massacre was not in his personality. In 1925, Lorenz was caught searching for something in the ruins of the farm that had been demolished in 1923. He panicked and told a story that he wanted to check for two holes that the killers had dug for burying the corpses. This had never been reported before. A lot of people accused him of being the murderer and Lorenz filed a lot of defamation lawsuits against them and won them all. But in the end, doubts remained. Lorenz Schlittenbauer died in 1941, taking all his secrets with him. Aftermath No one knows if money had been stolen and if yes, how much. Hyperinflation had already started in April 1922 and even if there really had been 100,000 marks in the house, one year later that wouldn't have been enough to buy a loaf of bread. Nearly every evidence from that time is destroyed including the heads of all six victims that had been conservated. All witnesses, policemen and prosecutors are long dead. In 2007, a group of students of a German police academy used the case for their final exam and concluded that even if the killer could not be named with 100% certainty, the evidence would point out one single person, but they would not publish the name, as the heirs of all the subjects are still living in the area. So. Who did it? After reading through all the papers and documents available, I will now present you my own suspect, one that had never been mentioned in the investigation, no one had ever suspected, just because of the simple fact that it was a woman. Remember, the world of 1922 had been a man's world. Women were not allowed to do anything. A widow inheriting a farm like Victoria Gabriel had either to get married again or, as in Victoria's case, had to leave all important deeds to her father. Women could not have applied for a loan or buy or sell property. All police officers and prosecutors and state attorneys were men. Naming a woman as suspect for such a brutal crime would have been ridiculous in 1922. The person I mean is no other than Lorenz Schlittenbauer's second wife, Anna Schlittenbauer, née Dick. Who was she and why do I think that she had committed such a heinous crime? Anna Dick was born in 1892 in Diepholzhofen. Lorenz's relationship with Victoria ended around January 1919 when she was pregnant with Josef. Lorenz had wanted to marry Victoria but her father denied his blessings. Lorenz was a widower, and after he could not marry Victoria, he married Anna Dick. This seemed to have been an arranged marriage, as the two only met once, three weeks before the wedding in May 1921. Anna was 29 years old, 18 years younger than her husband, and already had four illegitimate children. Three died early, one was adopted by Lorenz. Imagine being a woman in that time. Unmarried, with four children, your parents arrange a wedding, you move to your new husband's home in a strange environment, your husband could as well have been your father, his kids from his first marriage only a bit younger than yourself. Then you find out that he had a love affair with the woman living next door, Victoria, wealthy, popular and beautiful, that he had fathered a son with her. Wow, poor Anna. She became pregnant and her daughter Anna was born February 25, 1922, but died on March 26 and was buried on March 13, one day before the murders. Had she been envious of the woman next door who had everything, money, beauty, the love of Lorenz and kids who survived? Had the death of her daughter been the last straw? Had she felt like a substitute? Fact is, she had been alone at that night as Lorenz had been on the hay watch all night. And she had not been a frail little woman. She was 30 years old, had worked on farms her whole life and had been used to hardship and hard labor. She had slaughtered animals, cut firewood and was a lot different from women nowadays. 
Physically, she had totally been able to commit the murders. And maybe there had been enough hatred and envy against the Gabriel Gruber family and on the day after the burial of her daughter, being alone at home, something had snapped. What do you think? Leave your comments under the video, leave a like and if you want, subscribe to the channel. I hope you liked today's very special episode, so please remember guys and girls, comment, leave a like, subscribe and if you want to donate some money, find my PayPal account down in the description. It will all go to the Ukraine. And that's the end for today. I am Mordecai folks, have a nice day!